Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View, we pick the right topics, get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. It's interactive. We're live tonight with the Deputy Majority Leader in Parliament. As Parliament reconvenes on Tuesday, and as the government tries to iron out some economic policy ideas to help Ghana deal with the serious battering it's received, we find out what role Parliament is playing in all this. The all-important E-Levy is yet to be passed, although the budget has been passed. We're speaking to the leadership of the majority in Parliament on the role they are playing in Ghana's economy and what can be done to get Parliament to support the government to get things done better. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Mama Jossie. Ah, fe fe. Ah. Hmm. <laughs> Different era, better result. Time has changed and time has brought Kel Charcoal Toothpaste. Healthy gums, anti cavity, fresher breath, and it whitens teeth. Kale chocolate Welcome back to The Point of View. So tonight, my guest is MP for Efutu and Deputy Majority Leader in Parliament, Honorable Alex Afenyo Makin. Good evening. Welcome to the show. Good evening, sir. I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. Especially after your eventful weekend, we understand you were the guest speaker at the 92nd St. Augustine's Speech Day. Your mates se selected you to give that speech. That must, be, that, that must have been wonderful. An honor, a privilege. Mm. And uh, it was a moment of nostalgia going back. Mm to St. Augustine's after 26 years or more. 26 years since you left yeah. school? The story was quite interesting. Apparently, you were a poor student, you needed a scholarship, was sacked for school fees, didn't have a mattress, all uh, of that. We don't want to repeat that. Yes, of course, um, we had a difficult time in school. Of course, three years without a mattress, you would have to rely on the blanket of your colleagues. And the fact that finally uh, it took Parkway Syndrome's um, bursary. You know, he set up this um, Best Student Award that he wanted somebody to break his record. So he had this in place. And uh, by the grace of God, when I got that award, that was what paid my You broke Indom's record? Uh, what record was that? Uh, well, I can say that he put something there for best in history, literature, and government. And uh, the grace uh, was upon me, so I got it. So you're in Arts 2? Arts 2, that's correct. History, uh, literature, and government? That's correct. And uh, that was what paid for my final year and my registration. Oh, OK. And of course. For your WASI? That your time it was SSC. SSC, OK. But it must be emphasized. In St. Augustine, when you owe school fees, you receive six lashes before you are sent home. And it happened to me several times. <laughs> Is that they, practice they, still there? I don't know now, but it's free SHS today. Which may be reviewed. Oh, I, I do not expect government to review it and ask that we pay. It's free SHS. Well, and maybe because point. of the speed they are not following. We spoke to information minister today. No, no, I'm not, he's uh, talked about general yes. yes, and I'm saying that I do not expect to see that. I see. Hmm. And Indum is an Absunian. 
Yeah, he is. Is he happy with your government for what has happened to How his bank? How would I know? What has happened to his bank? Oh, come on. How would I know? Okay. I'm sure he will be honored that you mentioned his name. Be that as it may, Parliament reconvenes on Tuesday. We'll come to that shortly. I, I called up your opposite number, James Krucha, Veggie, MP for K2 North, a few hours before we came on air, to just get his general sentiment on the goings on in Parliament and also his reaction to what has been going on in terms of the cabinet retreat and the proposals. Let's hear what Mr. Veggie said to me before we came on air. So we now want to speak to the MP for Ketu North, who is also the Deputy Minority Leader in Parliament, Honorable James Krutia Veggie, on some of the happenings in Parliament. As we've been told, the Cabinet had a special session at Pedriasi. They have announced some proposals. I asked the Information Minister, Kojo Ponkrumah, this morning on radio, why the government was not organizing a Sinti-type forum to bring in all minds to discuss the economy. And his answer was that, they were trying to do what the NDC did in Senchi with Parliament. But it appears it's not worked. So, Honorable James Kucha Veggie, thanks for joining us. Uh, go, uh, good evening. Good evening, and a good evening to you, our viewers. So, the information minister tells me that the, the government has been trying to get consensus from Parliament because I asked him why they were not organizing a Senchi type conversation on the economy this time around. And he says, what your side did when you in government in 2014 is what they are trying to do through parliament. But it looks like parliament is not cooperating with the, the executive. What's your comment on that? Do you get the sense that the government has been trying to use parliament to build consensus on the economy? Um, Bernard, I'm surprised that the information minister is trying to play this game. Um, to the best of my knowledge and to the best of the knowledge of the minority leadership, we do not have any sense of any understanding that the challenges that the, this country is going through, the government want to use parliament to do the essential type of the workshop or the conference that NDC did in 2014. We do not have any idea of that sort. If it's a new thing that they are trying to bring up, they should rather come forward straight because we do not have that idea at all. Nothing of that sort came to our attention. So as far as Parliament is concerned, you have not been reached out to by the executive or from the majority side on trying to resolve the difficulties you are in. You yourself, you're a chartered accountant. You know the challenges we are facing on both the fiscal side. What is your view on where we are in the economy and the role of Parliament in that issue? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, our position as a minority, our reaction to the economy, the state of the economy, is kind of a vindication of the position that we in minority hold from, for a long time, that the policies of this government will one day crash. The policies of this government will one day take us to a position that we are today. So it is a vindication of what we have been talking about. The economy is in tatters. The economy is nothing to write home about because nothing seems to be working. Everything is not holding. Nothing at all is holding. Revenue not coming. Expenditure high. Borrowing over the bar. So nothing is holding. So all the, the accumulation of the effect of the policies of this government over the years is what we are seeing now. Nobody, nobody, not the government, to blame the, the current situation, what is happening now in Ghana, in terms of our economy, on what is happening now in the world. This, what is happening in the world now, is just a minute contributor to the effect. It is something that has built up over the years. For the past four or five years, the buildup of, of the, the effect of the, the, the policies is what we are seeing today. So we are not surprised at all because we know one day. In fact, they have, it has even run uh, for five years. We are, we are even surprised that it ran for five years. But we are not surprised that it's happening because we know it will happen one day. The effect of this, when the opposition advice, 
government doesn't take it. Government sees anything coming from opposition as opposition. Because the thing that opposition is doing that in order to ditch the government, we are not, look, we are members of parliament and when we are debating issues on the floor, we debate with the knowledge that we have as members of parliament individually, then we take position as a party. So when individuals are debating and they are profile or offering solutions to problems, they don't take it. They just see it as something that these people are doing in order to bring our government down. But that is not a position. So we are not surprised, but it's a vindication of what we have been saying over the years. There, there are some who think that you are going out of your way to frustrate the government. I think last week there was a, an agreement for a hospital to be built. I think it was, I don't know whether it was 30 or 300 million euro, which for some reason, for lack of quorum, I think the minority said it did not fly. What, what are you really trying to achieve? Because you do know that a lot of government's economic agenda has to come through the house. And if the minority does not cooperate or agree, those deals stand vitiated. What's your reaction to those who say you've taken a position to frustrate government when it comes to passing of anything because of where we are in the economy? First of all, we are not frustrating government. Far from it. Secondly, parliament is a matter of its, of its own rules. Over the years, we, because we are masters of our own rule, we overrule certain things. You will see that when it comes to business of the house, quorum is needed, but we overlook it because we want the government to have the opportunity to govern. When they bring loan facilities, sometimes you will see people in the, on the floor, not more than 40, but we approve this because we are masters of our own role. But where the Supreme Court decides to dove into how parliament operates and have made a ruling, we want to go by that ruling. So we are not frustrated. Supreme Court says that we need to tell a one third, which is 93 members, to transact business. And then we need 138 to take decision. We know that that is a position of uh, the law or the, the standing orders and the constitution. But because we govern our own affairs and we want the country to move forward, we overlook certain things. But now that the Supreme Court decided to do that, we want to implement what the Supreme Court is saying. So we are not frustrating government business. When we have the numbers on the floor, we take decision. When we don't have the numbers to take decision, but we have the numbers to transact business, we will do that. So, simply put, we are not frustrating government business, but we want to ensure that the ruling of the Supreme Court is followed. Simple. What is your understanding of why the State of the Nation address has still not been read? Well, it is, first of all, it's unfortunate that the State of the Nation address has not been read. We are coming to the end of the quarter, the first quarter. I hope, I hope that it will be read before the end of the quarter, or uh, the worst of it may be by the first week of uh, April. But sometimes, if you look at it, you, you end up by saying that you are not surprised because it looks like the president has no message for the country. The state of the economy is so bad that he has no good story to tell Ghanaians. So, is the president running away from the address? We don't know. But some of us believe strongly that this delay is coming because the president has no message for the, for the state. I heard, I think, a member of the majority say one of the reasons why the address has not been read was that Mr. Speaker had not scheduled it. I believe the Speaker has a role to play in what is happening on the floor. I believe business committee. What can you tell me about that? We scheduled third March. We scheduled third March. The business committee scheduled third March for the president to come and give the state of the nation's address. What happened? The president said he will not come. Because the information that we got as a business committee, because the president thinks that giving the state of the nation address on the third and then following it up with a six March message 
will be too much. So there must be some spacing. So, okay. If, so, if you say that the speaker has not fixed date, the business committee fixed third March, which the speaker also agreed or accepted, but the president failed to come by giving the reason I, I just, I've just said, and he did not come. So nobody should blame the speaker. Because of that date, the speaker has to reschedule his visit for medical review two times. And eventually, when the third March was not uh, accepted by the president or he was not ready to come, the speaker has to travel, and he has traveled. So nobody should blame the speaker. If the president had come on the third, will be, this would have been things of the past. So nobody should blame Mr. Speaker. Well, that was James Kusia Veji talking to me earlier in the day. So, Honorable Markin, I think we should go straight to the points raised there. Let's start with the latest being the State of the Nation. It wasn't read on the 3rd of March. Today is the 21st of March. Do we know when it will be read? Well, I read the, the business statement last week for the ensuing week. And I was very categorical mm. that the coming to the f house by the president uh, normally is preceded by some communication. The speaker and the leadership would have to agree on a firm date and communicate saying these are part of the internal workings of parliament. I'm surprised that that one too would become a partisan issue. So I would simply say that Parliament would communicate a convenient date to Mr. President. It isn't the case that Mr. President has refused or is running away from Parliament. We have not communicated a convenient date to his office. So was the third of, and that would was be, the third of March proposed? We suggested third of March, and that third of March we're supposed to also consult Mr. Speaker. Business committee does its proposal. And in fact, that proposal would have to, you know, run through the system. So it is never the case that a, a date was given to Mr. President and he said no. It is never the case. And I'm wondering why uh, my, my respected colleague would make a political statement uh, of, of that nature. Mm. So can you confirm if by end of this month it will be read? I can confirm to you that parliament through its leadership and the speaker will communicate a convenient date for mr president i believe that mr president is ever ready to come i see there was a view that it was because the e-levy hadn't been passed a view and he felt that that being one of his main fiscal policies there was no point in coming to speak when that barrier hadn't been cleared that is to suggest that Mr. President determines when to come. But the Constitution is quite clear in terms of the fact that he has to read the sense of the nation when Parliament re reconvenes, in terms of your, this session of Parliament, right? Yeah, but I have told you that we are to communicate to him. And it's, 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 so, it's as so, simple So it's as a that. parliamentary failure, not an executive failure. Well, we may not have to use the word failure politics or democracy is about continuous engagement. So mm. take away the word failure. We are supposed to engage like we all know Mr. Speaker for some unavoidable reasons is out of the jurisdiction and it's been in and out and all that. Um, as we speak, the majority leader is attending uh, an international uh, uh, event which is taking him way, way mm. far off the jurisdiction. So the way we operate, mm. uh, it's important for people to appreciate uh, Parliament. Is this and not something the Deputy Speaker can do on behalf of the Mr. Speaker? I don't have that impression. Mm. Yes. I'm asking because we know there have been disagreements over yeah, so, what the substantive so, can do so, and what the... So let's stay on, on the point that the speaker and leadership will have to agree and communicate a convenient date to Mr. President. 
and I think that should be enough. Is it just, uh, just, 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 but is it just a perfunctory role? Because some people have said to me, even on my radio show, that the way the economy is going and the way things are hard, the issue of the state of the nation is very critical. They want to hear from the president, speak to them on the state of the nation. Parliament doesn't seem to hold that view. It, it, it's taking a very lax approach. You see, it's unfortunate that our friends are behaving as though they've never been in government, as though their ability to come to power is about how hard they negotiate and how they're able to frustrate this government. To them, the more you frustrate, the more you create that state of hopelessness. But you see, uh, very soon, Ghanaians would read in between the lines and may let them know that, unfortunately, they are also really destroying our very democracy. Look, when government announced its fiscal policy, mm. i.e. this e-levy, and by the way, for the records, for five years, for five years of the NPP administration, mm. this e-levy is the first ever tax policy to be introduced, just for the records. For five years, this government introduced social intervention programs and abolished taxes or reduced that it had come to inherit. Free SHS was not introduced with a free SHS levy. Mm. Restoration of teacher training allowance and nursing training allowance were not done with the introduction of taxation. And in fact, electricity tariffs were reduced without the introduction of any other levy. This is the first... So the sanitation tax, this, the sanitation tax you introduced is not a new this, tax? This is, this, is, this is a first major... That, ah, so now you are qualifying it? Yes, I, I, I said the, so. the sanitation I, tax I, is a I, tax. Is it not I, major? I, I, I said that this is the first major fiscal I see. policy decision in terms of taxation that this government is introducing. Now, our friends, we were all engaging on the table. And don't forget that their leader came out to announce to the whole world that they were open to 1%. At the time that the one percent was the, announced, the, the minority leader. That is correct. At the time that one percent was announced by them, on the negotiation table, they were willing to take one point two five. Then all of a sudden, when he made that announcement, the party machinery said no. And they now say zero tolerance. Which serious democracy will tolerate this? He Aveji knows that he led the side even when we set up a new team to negotiate and i led our side we had serious engagement but on any time that we made progress you would have the external forces coming in and like i've said the external forces within their ranks believe that this is an opportune time to squeeze the government that if you allow this to pass you may never get the opportunity to win or that if they get this e-levy through, there will be enough funding for the road sector and to deal with the unemployment situation. But seriously speaking, a government is elected into office and as part of it, bona fides, is to introduce social intervention programs to benefit the people. In parliament, over 90% of tax questions that are filed are on roads. Okay. I just wanted to point out and to you... And we all to, to talk th about... Yes, I, to, I, to, if I may land yes, on the point. To, yes. Yes. Uh, Bernard, I will finish. Mm -hmm. And we all complain about the unemployment situation in the country. So if government comes out to say that I'm introducing a levy to resolve two things specifically, what you can ask for then is demand for a transparent system of disbursement and a transparent accountability, then we are all 
in the construct positively together. But where you say that you will not allow, meanwhile, meanwhile, you are again saying that government should find the money. Now, I heard my brother Aviji on this point. He said that from day one, he knew that this government was going to fail. Going to fail on what grounds? You had introduced taxes into the system. And the same Ghanaians were overburdened with taxes. Don't forget that even electricity tariffs, they themselves said that the cost of production was said that they could not reduce it. And they were bold about it. The government came, domestic users, almost about 18%. Bulk users, corporate, it went up to 30%. These were announced. Check it. I see. Do I, the fact check. Fair enough. And then you turn around to say that all these intervention programs mm. that were being introduced, government was bound to fail. Well, that's his then, opinion. No, 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 I just want to make point. But to it's an unfortunate no position. You, you've made, to take, you've made, but I, I need to. You've made two I factual need to statements. E e expose him on I, that. We made factual statements which purport to be facts. You have to correct. So you Please said, let's proceed. You said that the e levy is the first tax major. Major. Again, we don't have the liberty of describing what is major or minor. I need to point out to viewers that you introduced a sanitation and pollution levy. You also introduce a financial sector cleanup tax. Those are just two taxes your government has introduced. Number two, even in terms of the special petroleum tax, which you opposed when you were in opposition, you reconfigured it into an ad valorem tax. So it's not as if you have not touched those taxes. So I'm just pointing no, out okay, to you that so if you say the e-levy is the first tax or major tax you've introduced, you don't have the liberty to say that that's not correct. Uh, uh, uh. Because the, the financial sector cleanup tax is a tax you introduced, the sanitation and pollution levy is a tax you introduced. So that is just for the record. And this is a matter of all of us can confirm. B B Bernard, so you quote me right, and in context, you are talking about fiscal stability. And I am talking about a major tax decision. Why? What you qualifies as a major tax? Because we are looking at a critical sector of the economy. We are looking at the road sector. And then we are looking at supporting the entrepreneurial drive of the ordinary Ghanaian who is unemployed looking for jobs. And we are saying that instead of many people chasing for public sector jobs, this is a major decision by government to look for capital to support young Ghanaians who are out there chasing for jobs, do not have jobs, but have yeah, creative but now skills. You are talking about the reason. No. You, see, you, you see, we are, we are doing economics. You even reconfigured VAT and NHL. I'm just pointing out to viewers that that statement you said is not factual. We don't have to split us over it. You have qualified it, but I'm saying we will not accept you to make such a categorical statement no. that the e-levy is the first major tax you've introduced. That's not correct. So let's move forward. No, I, I, Bernard, we may stay Because there's no, there's no, no, there's no you, dictionary that defines what a, a no, major no, no. tax is. You, if, you see... There's no dictionary. There's it, no a it, government. A gov what is a major tax? A, a government may introduce a number of tax policies. Yes. All right. Yes. But among these, may be a critical one, which has a snowball effect, which will have a major impact on the economy. And I qualified my statement by saying that if you look at the five years when we came in. There were a number of taxes that we abolished. There were a number of taxes that the NDC had in place that we had to even reduce the rates, factual, for the five-year period that we had been in, we, we were in office. Now you, I'm saying that for this policy that was introduced in the budget, is the first major. Yeah, you, can, you are liberty to say that, but I, I, but, I don't, but I don't have to accept it. That's well, what I'm saying. Then you, and I'm, and you, you and can I'm, disagree and I'm with pointing me. out to I my viewers that, that if that you is say not it is not factual, then you're also wrong. No, because, because I said it's the first major. And I'm saying that... If I say first major, if I said it's the first tax to be introduced, you are at liberty to say it is not factual. But I'm saying that it's our first major tax policy as a government. I stay by it. Fair enough. The viewers will decide. We'll That's take a, fine. We'll take, That's a, fine. we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll look at the posture of the majority because it's a thin majority. But is it all the fault of the minority where we are? Have they made concessions that can help things get forward? And we'll look also at what are the possible effects of the cabinet proposals 
The Bank of Ghana has spoken. They've increased their prime rate from 14.5 to 17. We are expecting finance ministry and energy ministry to make some announcements, as we are expecting the president to also make some announcements. But will they be enough? Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. So tonight we're trying to understand what role Parliament has played and can play in getting Ghana out of the economic malaise. Now, we are not blaming Parliament for what has happened, but it's important to know that after the fractious rejection and approval of the budget itself, there have been issues. Now, the E-Levy, which is the bill to accompany the policy of the E-Levy, has not been passed. And as we speak, we don't know when it will be passed. Mr. Penny Markin is telling us he expects by end of the month or early next month, the president will address the state of the nation. Do we know when the E-Levy will be tabled again? Because again, the minority have said, we are waiting for the E-Levy. It appears either the majority don't have the numbers or they don't seem ready to bring the E-Levy bill. We've heard the, the opposite side say this. So just a quick point on the E-Levy. You've said that the majority, minority wants to frustrate the E-Levy. But I've heard them say, they've been asking you to bring the levy to parliament and you've not brought it. At least after the initial fracas, I've heard not one, not two, about three minority MPs say, where is the E-Levy? You've not, you've not tabled it since. What's going on? When you say after the initial fracas, what do you No, mean? but of course, the approval of the budget itself, the reversal and all the cases that have to do with it, the E-Levy bill has not been... No, the day... Wait. The day we were doing the E-Levy bill was when members on their side attacked the speaker. You recall that? In December. When we were considering the E-Levy bill was when they disrupted proceedings. So let's correct But you've that. had many sitting since. No, no. I, I, Bernard, you, you, if you want us to... No, go, my pro, no, I didn't no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, saying that, that... I'm saying that you, see, you recall that that incident happened. No problem. Right. So let's move on But they there. are asking where no, the bill move, is. Let's move on That's the question there. I'm asking you. The bill remains the property of parliament. Okay. It's a document in parliament. Mm -hmm. They raise issue of engagement. It's mm -hmm. not everything that I can specifically let out. Mm -hmm. But they know that both sides have been engaging on this. The finance minister did not just get up to announce the 1.5%. Mm -hmm. Some discussions were held. Mm -hmm. The finance minister did, didn't get up to announce the 0.25% mm -hmm. from the telcos. Mm. So it should tell you that of all the concerns that came from their side, we didn't just sit down on it. Some senior members from both sides have been engaging on this. Okay? Mm. Mm. We've had out-of-parliament discussions. Okay. We, we've sat at a round table. We've had a weekend of discussion. Both mm. sides. All right? I can't give you the details, but... Both, part, both sides agree that we must make a headway on this matter. Okay. We agree that we must have, make a headway on this matter. But I'm also telling you that there are some hardliners, some hawks, some external forces on the side of the NDC who still believe that for this to go through, their chances of coming to power in 2024 will be slim. Therefore, they should hold this and squeeze as much. But even if that blood is true, is that not normal? I am saying is that not normal parliamentary political po politicians behaving. Politically, it may be expedient, mm. and you are right in saying that. But you yourself should ask yourself where we find ourselves as a country. Really, if the government introduces e levy, mm. and e levy comes, would that stop NDC from? any uh, opportunity yeah. to win some votes but, but, oh, no, but if, even, even, even if this is true is this not really a test of the leadership of the government on the executive side and of the majority's leadership because you always have hawks you always have people disagreeing you always have opposition and when you were in opposition you were the mpp was also very you didn't even stand up for 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 Sinchi. In fact, when Kwame Pianin turned up for saying he was almost ostracized. MPP opposed a lot of things NDC did. So the point about opposition is not an issue. Isn't it more, more a question of 
a test of how you build consensus and lead in a difficult time. Bernard, Instead of blaming the opposition. Ben, ben, Bernard, you say that this is a, a fact-based platform. Yes. So, fact. Is it a fact that the NDC government invited the minority into that Senchi meeting? I do not know whether formally, no, no, but no, they did say no, in public no, no, that you were invited. No, 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 no. You see, you no, said that when no, no, oh, you, Bernard, you, you introduced you this no, but fact, fact I, I, matter. I, I, I don't, let's not split it. No, no, we are not. It, was, it, was, it was public knowledge that the Senchi program was open to everybody. We had NDC, Setekbe and Co say they Bernard. were inviting MPP. Bernard. MPP did not turn up. Bernard. This is a fact. Bernard. What is what don't is go there. what what is you what is non factual about this? The MPP said clearly they you, were not going to show you, up. You, you, no, 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 please. No, please. Like some executives from MPP said they wouldn't go. Oh, my brother, please. I was on air. I remember we even covered that program. Okay, which MPP member went for that program? Let's make progress. Can you give me one MPP let's, who, let's who went for progress. that program or who, who represented MPP on that let's, program? Let's make progress. Let's make is this not a test of the leadership of Nana Kufuado when you have a very slim majority if there's a majority at all in parliament and subsequently a test on the leadership of you and chairman sabunsu and the leadership you are basically facing it's almost like you are a student leadership facing a very strong opposition how do you bring them along because you have the national government so instead of saying it's the ndc or the opposition i'm putting the question back to you is this not a test of the leadership of this government which it is not passing yet the reason why we have still not proceeded and we are still engaging is simply to tell you that we believe that there must be some consensus somewhere okay mm -hmm. and that is why we've all spent our time our energies meeting each other we've been discussing matters amongst ourselves mm -hmm. and have certain agreement as to how to proceed mm. in terms of this bill and like i said earlier the 1.5 percent reduction was not accidental discussions were held harun idrisu's uh, one percent announcement was not accidental the engagement we had with our their side on the need to build consensus on this has been ongoing. So, if we don't appreciate the fact that we need to build consensus, wouldn't have been engaging. But you see, we are also in a, a political space. So, you would hear certain public pronouncements being made here and there. I'm not too bothered about those, those ones. But I can say to you, on good authority, that we've been engaging and the engagement appears positive and i believe that if the way we are going we are able to proceed on that path would we'll be able to go through with this because the situation is such like that we need to fix our roads almost every mp is asking for roads to be fixed all of us are complaining about the unemployment situation in the country the e levy is not a general purpose let me ask you a couple of tax questions Look. How come the tax exemptions bill, which a lot of experts, including Ali and Natia, have said could give Ghana a lot of tax windfall, has not been passed? Number two, how come property tax, which a lot of people feel is a more progressive tax, has not been passed for five years, right? Now, we are not against raising taxes, but these are two critical tax issues that the government has not properly dealt with. So what's your what's your what's your response to those two critical issues tax exemptions which the president himself has complained about the massive tax exemptions we give to companies some of which they don't deserve and property tax which all economists agree is more progressive than any other tax for five years you've not passed it so let me first deal with the issue of uh, the tax exemption thing there's a bill mm -hmm. what the bill does is is basically to regulate Mm -hmm. ensure that if there's going to be tax exemption, mm -hmm. then indeed that company is deserving of that. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that Parliament has failed to pass that? No. I think the bill 
was introduced, uh, is the, the finance committee is looking at it. And we have a process. So on that score, I would disagree with you. We come to the issue of property tax. Yes, I agree that we need to broaden the, uh, the tax net. Again, we also have to look at areas where we, uh, we can easily tap. When, what is the use? When you have property in the country and then you don't pay tax on it. Again, it's data. Okay? We need to have reliable data on all of these to be able to sufficiently tax. If you don't have your data right and you are imposing taxation, at the end of the day, the law will be there. So mm. I believe that, yes, there could have been some delay in there. But again, we should also look at the, look at the fact that our complete data on, on, on properties in Ghana, you know, may not be up to speed. So it's a thing that we have to look at. But that is not to say that because we have not covered that, it's good to bring it on the table. Now, okay, speed up on this one as well. Get the data right on all of these as well. But at the same time, you have this policy aimed at helping fix your roads. You have the impatient, unemployed youth, a graduate sitting at home waiting for public sector job. No, he has creative skills. He has some ideas. Mm. You want to help that person to get capital. Can we get this one also through? Because you see, it's not a general purpose tax. This e-levy is very specific. And I have said that, look, we can have quarterly or every six months, Minister of Finance appearing before the Finance Committee telling us specifically what these funds have been used for in terms of the rules that have been fixed, the entrepreneurship, the you start program. Fortunately, the government intends to use the banks for disbursement. So these ones will, can will be the, properly will the, will the be accounted for. Will yes. the ELV be collateralized? The Minister for Roads let the cut out of the bag, I think, when he appeared before the Parliament a few weeks ago, and he made that allusion. You've said here a couple of times that we all need roads. Is the e-levy being sought for for its own merit? Or is it more to expand the government's ability to borrow by it being collateralized? Okay, Bernard. Uh, Honorable Amakata was taken out of context. And this social media world that we're in, even when you don't slip, people are likely to pick you out of context and deal with you and it becomes the order of the day. Now, let's face facts. You have receivables. So in a year, you know that you expect, say, a billion. You have roads to do, construct. You have contractors to pay. So if you pledge your receivables to raise funds, is there anything wrong with it? No. I say no. Provided those steps that you are taking are reasonable, and you are not going into basically just borrowing for the sake of borrowing. But if you know, because the receivables are not going to come same day, you have a year long to collect the levy. You have rules to fix. So if at a point, and you think that there's a need to pledge the receivables to get the funds to fix the roads, it will be in order to so do that's that. that's collateralization. I am saying, that I'm explaining. You talked about collateralization. Yeah. And I'm explaining the context within which such a thing can happen. And it wouldn't be wrong in taking that decision. Because you are, you, it's a receivable bank. So you are saying it's possible that... It is possible. And the, so when people report it, that the e-levy, one of the reasons being contemplated is for that possibility. You see, what is when, you, when you... See, it depends on the context you put it. When and this, I, I chair the road fund. When NDC was in office and they, they were bedding payment of contractors, P contractors are all over. They fix your roads, they take loans from the bank, and the banks are worrying them. There are guru boys all over. What did the NDC do? They went to UBA, looked at the cash flow that in a year they expect so much. They did a spread three years, four years. They expect these inflows. Okay, so we want to 
take, say, 30% of the inflows, the expected receivables, and then we pay the contractors. Where is the money going to? I think that in all of this construct, the transparency and yeah. the intention is important. The collateralization was not an NDC point. It was more because the Bank of Ghana on Friday told us that the debt to GDP is now 80%. Again, in NDC's time, when the debt to GDP was 70%, all hell broke loose. Dr. Baumia and the MPP team made a lot of noise about the debt to GDP under CETEC by crossing 67%. It's now 80.1%. So when the context, when the question of collateralization is raised, it's not being raised as an NDC issue. It's being raised as no, a No, no, don't, don't get me. I am also no, not no, raising this. No, no, I, no. I gave you I, an I, example I, I, I'm, I'm saying that, by saying that it, no, it didn't I'm happen. And our if debt it is to happening, GDP, it no, should happen in context. Yes, and the context is that your debt to GDP is now 80%. So if you want to collect whatever amount you want to collect of e-levy to allow you space to borrow more, that's a challenge. You see, Bernard, again, that is where the mistake would arise. Let me explain again. You are not introducing the levy merely because you want to collateralize it. No. I am saying that you have the levy. You are not getting all the money in the same day. As you collect, you pay contractors. But if at a point the need arises for you to fix more roads, to get more contractors on, this, on, on our roads. And bear in mind that the contractors, there's a whole value chain. If you get a contractor on the road, the unskilled get job, the skilled labor get job, the artisans, the professionals, they all get job. There's a whole value chain. The woman who is selling kinky, fish, gari, rice, wache, all of them, get the opportunity. So it is not a matter of you are going to use a levy to borrow. No. I get it. But the point is that as you get, you pay. Meanwhile, if you look at the situation and they say that there are critical roads to be financed, there are some critical roads to be constructed, and there is a need, then you appraise the whole situation and say, that, okay, then on this, maybe there are some critical roads Let's look at 10% of the receivables and then get it and pay the contractors. Is it also the case that we want our contractors to work without being paid? You know, a lot of contractors are losing their businesses. Banks are charging interest because they have worked. They've taken loans and they have so not been you paid. Are you, know saying, about you are that. saying that it is possible that it will be collateralized. But that's not the main reason why it's being done. Obviously, Fair it enough. cannot be the case. Fair enough. We'll take a break. This is still the point of view. My guest is MP for Futu and also the deputy majority leader in parliament. There are some who say, in fact, I heard Kassela Tufosin say last week or so that it looks like the MPP members of parliament are not interested in parliamentary business because there are issues of quorum. Indeed, a very important agreement was not passed because the minority raised the issue of a voting quorum. What is leadership on the majority side doing to get their numbers to turn up for important discussions? Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. My guest, Alexander Peño Marking, he's the MP for Futu, also Deputy Majority Leader. Quick factual point about the tax exemptions. First introduced in 2019, um, it, it's gone and come back. There's been a first reading. Finance Minister says it will be passed in the next meeting. He said it's in December 2021. So this meeting of Parliament that we are in, he expects the tax exemptions bill to be passed. That's the first point. A couple of quick uh, comments that people have sent in in relation to what we are saying. Uh, good evening, Bernard. If the date were not set for the state of the nation, why would Apenyo Makin himself communicate that it had been postponed? This is Jabba in Tema. Bernard, uh, we need no state of the nation address because we already know our state. He will come and tell us it's a world phenomenon. How can I pay eleven that will be given to an individual in the name of you start? And then he says a few other things. Bernard, MPP is a centre-right party. Centre-right parties don't focus on social interventions. They cut taxes for the economy to grow and employ more people. MPP rather focus on taxation to more taxation quickly from La Paz. Let's come back to numbers. Last week, uh, an EU-funded hospital project couldn't go through. The minority were saying that based on the Supreme Court ruling on the Justice Abdullahi case, they would also stick to the issue of a voting quorum versus a deciding or dis discussion forum, 102 and 104. That seemed to be 
a, a curveball they threw at you because when I was watching the proceedings, your side seemed unprepared for that. You were looking for it for that particular, I think it was three hospitals, the bill to be passed, for them to raise the issue of the lack of a voting quorum, which until that Supreme Court ruling wasn't such an issue because usually when you have the decision quorum, some of those things go through, sort of took you, took you a bit by surprise. What's, what, what's reflecting on that? What's going on there? Is it tit for tat? Or has the Supreme Court ruling set the cat among the pigeons? You know, um, they started this issue of quorum long before the Supreme Court mm. decision. So to me, it's not about the Supreme Court decision. Mm. But it's about people failing to appreciate how we work as parliament. Mm. Parliament works on two fronts, plenary and committee. Mm -hmm. Parliament can never be full. And if we don't take our time to appreciate the fact that the chamber will always have some few people at a point in time and you have various members in committee doing committee work, they would always be ambushing our, our own fortunes. And I think, I think that our colleagues have soon forgotten the ruling of Mr. Speaker on presence in the chamber. When Mr. Speaker returned from his trip and he made his ruling in December regarding physical presence in the chamber, mm -hmm. He talked about the fact that when you are present, it does not necessarily mean you are seated on your seat. You see, we are kind of, I don't want to use the word petty, but it appears as if we don't understand the way we operate as a parliament. The day that they were talking about quorum, you have over 20 members at public account committee hearing. You have some other committee members who are traveled on a tour. You had another committee sitting. You have some committees um, visiting some sites. They know it. Then you say that, oh, you are now talking about quorum. Now, when on Friday, the first deputy speaker checked the attendance sheet, you realize that on the vote of, uh, the vote of uh, uh, Thursday, many people had registered. And when we go... As had been in parliament, but no, uh, not being within the exactly. chamber. Exactly. So in the chamber, you see, mm. we would have to explain to Ghanaians, for Ghanaians to know how we work, than to attempt using some technicalities to frustrate our own work. Because you can never record a certain number in the chamber yeah, unless it, you is, stop is, is, is it not because the Supreme Court in this judgment was quite see, clear the, on separating a quorum in 102 from the voting quorum in 104, which essentially was what made them say that when a deputy speaker is seated, it's a voting quorum, different from... So basically, the minority may be saying that ordinarily one-third is enough, but based on the ruling, now you need half. You see, that they, they've gotten it wrong. If the Supreme Court talks about quorum, mm -hmm. and you know that in the chamber, quorum would mean members present. But members present in what? Members present as seen at the plenary and seizing all other works that are supposed to be done or members present but have left for committee sitting. Get it right. You see, in parliament, the committee work is over 70, 80% of the plenary. The plenary will But can only they come vote while they're in committee? At the plenary, we only come to more or less announce decisions. No, when I'm saying, when, I'm saying, can they vote? Doing, if, if somebody, Bernard, is, if somebody Bernard, is in public accounts committee... Oh, in this has, ICT can world? They, can they vote? Today that we are in this ICT world, we cannot vote. Are you saying so? Has it happened before? Do you, have a, do you have a mechanism what, what, where somebody in a, different, in a committee, you know, in plenary, can vote for a plenary? The, the need has then arisen for us to do that. So maybe that's where you will go. We must do that then. Because don't also forget that mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker introduce some COVID measures that we should sit in our chamber, in our offices, 
and observe proceedings. You right. remember that Fair one? Enough. He let, has not. He has let not. Me, let me end with a, not fin a final question one. for you. So you and Chief Minister Bonsu being majority leadership, and very early in my journalism years, I was told that the leader of the house is the majority leader. So the speaker of parliament is not necessarily the leader of the house, right? So you and Chief Minister Bonsu constitute the leadership of the house. So the chaos in the house. How do you intend to resolve it? As, no, leader, you say, as leaders, no. because you are the leaders. No, 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 no. And if we have you, just one no, minute. No, no, no. Since we are learning, leadership of the house uh -huh. is not Afenio Makin and Chi. Leadership of the house is not the majority leader and the deputy majority leader. It's who? Majority leader, minority leader. No. Leadership include the five on the majority bench the whips too. and the five on the minority bench. I see. The ten constitute leadership. Together. Yes. So it's a collective failure. I don't know why this evening you're using the word failure, failure, failure. Of parliament what? to get, work together. That's the, that's the point. Not that you well, are that, failed. That is your point. Not that you are failed in, as li in life. I'm just saying parliament is failing to work together. Well, that's, that's what I, I'm saying. I would put it differently. I would rather say that um, insisting partisan position has affected our work. Look, our friends did so well when we we're doing the vetting. In fact, they were very cooperative. They've been cooperative. All right. Except that on e levy they've not. The the forces <laughs> that are bigger than them uh, have made it I virtually see. impossible for us to proceed. But I believe that there is still... There's hope. Hope. Well, good luck. Tomorrow, Tuesday, is when you go back. We wish you well. We wish all sides well. And we wish Ghana will progress. Thank you, Alex Apenyo Makin. Thank you so much, is too, the for MP the opportunity. For Efutu. He's also the deputy majority leader. And he gave the speech at the St. Augustine's 92nd anniversary. They say, Omnia Winkit Labor. So this is to all Absunians. Congratulations on 92. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. We'll see you next time. The business dashboard is next. Stay with CTTV.